Good afternoon. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, next is a public hearing on Bill 1621, Environmental Sustainability, Building Energy Use, Benchmarking and Performance Standards Amendments. This bill would expand the number of buildings covered by benchmarking requirements, amend certain definitions, uh, establish energy performance standard for covered buildings with certain gross floor area, create a building performance improvement board, and generally revise county law regarding environmental sustainability. A T&E committee work session will be scheduled at a later date, and persons wishing to submit additional material for the council's consideration should do so before the close of business on July 27th. I think we have seven speakers for this hearing. Ms. Kennedy, would you mind calling the first speaker? That's correct. Good afternoon. Yes, our first speaker this afternoon will be Adam Ortiz. Mr. Ortiz, you will have two minutes for your testimony, and you may begin when you're ready. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. President and uh, members of the Council. It's great to see all of you. Um, I'm here testifying from our LEED Platinum building in downtown Wheaton on behalf of the County Executive uh, for Bill 1621. Um, as this council has declared, we are in a climate emergency. Commercial building energy use accounts for about a quarter of the county's GHG emissions. Building energy performance standards, or BEPS, are a foundational policy highlighted in the climate action plans, which is absolutely necessary if we have any hope of meeting our goal of eliminating GHG emissions by 2035. While we have ambitious green building codes for new construction, we need similar requirements for existing buildings. Through BEPS, our existing inventory will reduce climate impacts through deep energy retrofits, operational improvements, and tenant engagement. As with our benchmarking policy, which is council passed years ago, Montgomery County is, con is poised to join a small group of innovative jurisdictions pursuing build building energy performance standards, and we'll be the first county in the United States to have such standards. But this is not coming out of nowhere. For years, we have worked with building stakeholders closely through the benchmarking program and by holding a number of marquee events on building efficiency. We've also been in conversation and have developed um, these policies that we're putting forward with these stakeholders for years. This legislation continues this culture of building owner engagement and includes um, in, an inclusive rulemaking framework for BEPS as we move forward. We have learned from some cities that have gone before us, and we think that our approach is actually a model approach for BEPS. In short, our approach, and this is a new term, friends, a trajectory approach, which is a phased long-term performance standard, highly engaged with our department that balances building owners' need for flexibility while also meeting energy reduction targets because each building and each industry sector is different. DEP is currently undertaking a comprehensive data analysis on the magnitude of energy savings that are achievable, as well as a cost benefit analysis of different retrofits and upgrades. Mr. Ortiz, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but your time is up. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you so much. Our next speaker for this public hearing will be Kate Stewart. Ms. Stewart, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin when you're ready. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Uh, today, I'm here to express Tacoma Park's support of the proposed building energy performance standards. The city is already subject to the county building benchmarking law and would be automatically opted into the BEPS law. BEPS is a necessary step beyond benchmarking to meaningful re meaningfully reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It has also many co-benefits that include lowering operating costs for building owners, improving health from better indoor air quality and reduced pollution, and creating local jobs. Jurisdictions around the country, including Washington, D.C., are increasingly using building energy performance standards to achieve their climate goals. The D.C. program started in January 2021 and covers commercial and multifamily buildings of 10,000 square feet or greater and use, utilizes a complementary technical hub to provide guidance and assistance to the private sector. We need to follow D.C.'s example, and we have the opportunity to partner with them to leverage and expand the available resources of the regional te technical hub. Buildings in Tacoma Park make up about half of all greenhouse gas emissions in the city, and addressing energy performance is necessary if we are to achieve our goal of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2035. 
The 26 buildings in Tacoma Park that the BEPS ordinance would apply include 16 multifamily buildings, two churches, schools, and several office buildings. This represents over 2.8 million square feet of building space in the city, a significant increase from the 70, 750,000 square feet from just seven buildings currently covered by the uh, existing benchmarking law. Given the amount of technical expertise, outreach, staff resources, and the financial assistance required to implement such a plan, it is in the city's best interest to have Montgomery County administer the, the BEPS program. The city asked the county to provide financial protections for low and moderate income residents of, co of covered multifamily buildings and include programs to mitigate the cost of compliance. The city is ready to support our building owners and the county however we can. Our staff will work with both Montgomery County staff and our impacted building owners in the city to ensure there's ample support should BEPS be adopted. We have to work together to be successful in achieving our climate goals, and we thank you for all your work. Thank, thank you, you for your testimony. <laughs> our next speaker for this public hearing is Cliff Majersik. Mr. Majersik, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin. Thank you very much and good afternoon. My name is Cliff Majerzyk. I'm a senior advisor at the Institute for Market Transformation. IMT is a national nonprofit that catalyzes sustained demand for high performance buildings. We work with more than 100 local governments to establish equitable building performance policies that save energy and greenhouse gas emissions. IMT strongly supports Bill 1621. In Montgomery County, buildings account for half of greenhouse gas emissions. To meet its climate goal, the county must dramatically improve the energy efficiency of its commercial and residential buildings. The bill will slash building energy use, moving the county significantly closer to its climate goals. Additionally, BEPS will drive private investment in buildings efficiency and on-site renewable power, cutting energy costs, accelerating investment in the county, and creating jobs at all skill levels, from electricians to engineers to roofers jobs which are tied to local buildings and cannot be offshored. These new jobs will help the county overcome economic shocks like the pandemic. IMT provided technical assistance and helped uh, facilitate the stakeholder group that advised the Department of Environmental Protection as it developed the bill. Together, we developed an innovative policy that provides building owners with regulatory certainty and flexibility while pushing them to quickly improve their properties. The bill recognizes and rewards the best performers while giving poor performing buildings a realistic and achievable path to compliance. We urge the county that the county explore providing resources to improve the energy performance of affordable housing and not deprive residents of utility bill savings and building improvements. Bill 1621 is thoughtful, ambitious, and realistic. It will be a big step for jobs and towards the county's climate commitment. By adopting the bill, the county will become the first county and seventh jurisdiction in the country to adopt building performance standards. We urge the council to promptly advance this bill, and we are available to assist the county with implementation. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Caroline Taylor. Ms. Taylor, you have two minutes, and you may begin. Thank you, and good afternoon. On behalf of Montgomery Countryside Alliance, I'm pleased to offer support for Bill 1621. This legislation is a substantive step as part of a systems approach aimed at net zero carbon emissions. Moreover, we echo the recommendations of our colleagues, notably Tacoma Park mobilization, that will further strengthen the bill. These recommendations call for a regulatory means to accelerate the performance timeline, promote inclusivity on the building performance review board, strengthen provisions that address the needs of moderate and low income housing, and support voluntary energy efficiency improvements and incentives for early adoption and performance of, of performance standards. The recently leaked UN IPCC draft is dire, but it's stressed that actions can still be taken to prevent worst case scenarios and reads in part. We need transformational change operating on processes and behaviors at all levels, individual, communities, business, institutions and governments. We must redefine our way of life and consumption. Let's pass this legislation and add strong regulatory framework and move on with the multitude of other important initiatives that we can collaboratively further. We are all in. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker for this public hearing is Todd Nedwick. Mr. Nedwick, you also have two minutes. You may begin when you're ready. 
Great. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, members of the Council. My name is Todd Midwick. I am the Senior Director of Sustainability Policy at the National Housing Trust. We are a nonprofit that creates and preserves affordable homes. We support the adoption of the Building Energy Performance Standards Policy in Montgomery County. Improving the energy efficiency of multifamily buildings can preserve, uh, preserve affordable housing by lowering operating costs, reduce residents' energy bills, and create healthier housing. However, affordable housing owners face several obstacles to improving the efficiency of their properties, including limited access to upfront capital and limited staff capacity. Therefore, it is essential that grant funding and technical assistance be available to help affordable housing owners comply with the law. To that end, we recommend that the council include in the legislation a funding mechanism to provide financial resources to support under-resourced buildings. Building performance legislation in other jurisdictions has included additional resources to assist building owners in meeting the required performance levels. For example, legislation enacted to create BEPS policies in Washington, D.C., Washington State, Colorado, and pending legislation in Boston establishes funding and technical assistance programs for under-resourced buildings. Uh, in D.C. specifically, legislation enacting BEPS required at least $3 million to be appropriated annually to assist affordable housing providers in complying with the performance standard. The mayor's proposed FY22 budget far exceeds this minimum amount and would spend $26.5 million to help owners of under-resourced buildings comply with the law. Montgomery County should take a similar approach to other jurisdictions with BEPS policies and create a funding mechanism to provide financial support to affordable housing owners. Doing so would send an important signal to the housing community that BEPS will be implemented equitably in keeping with the county's climate action plan principles. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker will be Shruti Betnagar. Shruti, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin as soon as you're ready. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council President Tucker and members of the Montgomery County Council. My name is Shruti Bhatnagar and I'm the chair of the Sierra Club Montgomery County Group. Sierra Club supports the adoption of building energy, use benchmarking and performance standards, BEPS, Bill 1621. Buildings constituent 50% of Montgomery County's greenhouse gas emissions, of which 26% are from commercial, build, commercial offices and multifamily residential buildings. Buildings energy performance standards in conjunction with benchmarking are a foundational tool for reducing greenhouse gas emissions from buildings. To reach the county's climate goals, greenhouse gas emissions reductions must be obtained from existing buildings. Jurisdictions around the country, including Washington, D.C. and the world, are increasingly using BEPS to achieve their climate goals. In Washington, D.C., BEPS was implemented in January 2021 and covers commercial and multifamily buildings of 10,000 square feet and greater and utilizes a complementary buildings innovation hub. For building performance standards to be successful, they must complement other policies and programs, such as energy benchmarking, as a part of the proposed legislation and education and technical assistance. The legislation contemplates partnering with and expanding Washington, D.C.'s Buildings Innovation Hub that is part of its BEPS program and that provides technical advice and guidance to buildings owner. At anticipating there will be concerns raised regarding the cost impact of this legislation, upon property owners and concerns for potential increased rent and pass-throughs to commercial and residential tenants as a result, we strongly recommend that the Department of Environmental Protection, Protection prepare data recommendations and potential funding sources to respond to these concerns. Every effort should be made to minimize the impact of this bill upon small businesses owners and low-income residential tenants who should not bear the financial impact of this important legislation through increases in rent or uncontrolled pass-throughs. BEPS is expected to produce many consequent benefits that Sierra Club supports, include, including increased energy efficiency, resiliency and sustainability of new and existing buildings, reduced energy consumption and air pollution, and improved human health benefits because of indoor, uh, better indoor and outdoor quality air. We also support creating more green jobs that come from construction and retrofit of buildings to increase their energy efficiency and resiliency that result in increased economic activity. Thank you for considering Sierra Club's input and position in support of this legislation. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker for this public hearing is Timothy Truitt. Mr. Truitt, you also have two minutes and you may begin when you're ready. Good afternoon. 
This bill is good as far as it goes, but the enforcement provisions need to be strengthened. Under this bill, a building owner could do nothing for years and then maybe pay a modest fine. The building owner could then continue to do nothing for more years. To prevent this scenario, what is needed is more frequent reporting of progress, quality assurance of the reported data to include audits and on-site visits, and transparency of the reported data, including making the data public at the level of individual buildings. More frequent reporting, perhaps yearly, could include answers to basic questions such as, have you started? Do you have a plan? Uh, what have you done? Even this minimal self-attestation could identify building owners whose efforts are clearly insufficient. Quality assurance and audits would provide an indication to the county about actual progress, actual progress, years before the first interim performance data is available. Full transparency of reported data could enable the power of public shaming to be brought to bear. The county will have very limited resources for compliance. Public reporting of performance data could help produce compliance. In summary, better enforcement provisions are needed. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. President, that wraps up the speakers for this public hearing. Thank you, Ms. Kennedy. Thank you so much to uh, all of our uh, guests today. The uh, next item is item six. It's a public hearing on Bill 2621, taxation payments in lieu of taxes, affordable housing amendments. This bill would establish a minimum payment in lieu of taxes for certain qualifying housing developments. It would eliminate the annual maximum aggregate amount of all payments in lieu of taxes approved under this section and generally amend the law governing a payment in lieu of real property taxes for certain housing developments. A geo committee work session will be scheduled at a later date. Persons wishing to submit additional material for the council's consideration should do so before the close of business on July 27th. We have seven speakers for this public hearing as well. Ms. Kennedy, could you please call on the first one? Yes, I can. The first speaker for this public hearing is Asim Nagam. Mr. Nagam, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin. Welcome, Director. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Council President and Council Members. My name is Asim Negam, Director of the Department of Housing Committee Affairs. I'm here on behalf of the County Executive to address Bill 26-21, Taxation Payment in Lieu of Taxes Affordable Housing. The County Executive is a strong supporter of increasing and retaining the supply of affordable housing in the county. For example, the recently negotiated transfer of a county-owned parcel Addition to help and view allowed us to leverage additional and deeply affordable housing in exchange for transferring ownership of the land. Our current practice in awarding pilot property tax relief to developers is based on DSCA's underwriting of the financial need of the project in delivering affordable housing units. We currently offer pilot tax benefit only for preservation and creation of dedicated affordable housing units. We do not offer pilot tax relief for market rate units, nor for MPDUs that are already required under the law. The bill proposes changes to the pilot program that need review and analysis to ascertain the impact of the delivery of incremental deeply affordable housing units. We look forward to working with the committee members on the review and to ensure all expected affordable housing is built on site. We support the overall intent of increasing affordable housing in the county. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker for this public hearing is Jane Lyons. Ms. Lyons, you have two minutes. Good afternoon, and thank you, President Hooker and council members uh, for the opportunity to provide testimony. My name is Jane Lyons, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Coalition for Smarter Growth, the leading organization in the DC region advocating for walkable, inclusive, transit-oriented communities as the most sustainable and equitable way for our region to grow and provide opportunities for all. Affordability is the key way to ensure our communities are inclusive to everyone, and Bill 2621 will make it easier for housing providers to achieve their missions of providing more affordable housing in Montgomery County. This bill largely standardizes an existing practice within DHCA, 
improves predictability by allowing builders to know upfront the amount of tax abatement they will receive and reduces the amount of funds taken out of the housing investment fund to cover property taxes. We believe that there is room around the edges to strengthen this bill without negatively affecting affordable housing providers. For example, we urge the committee to consider increasing the threshold of affordable units required to receive a full pilot from 50% to 60%. It is important that this bill balances flexibility for affordable housing providers and getting as much affordability as we can for as long as possible. We also echo the Montgomery Housing Alliance's testimony that you'll hear in a few minutes, that the pilot should not terminate after the 15 year minimum threshold so long as the housing provider maintains affordability beyond that period. While some adjustments could potentially improve this legislation even further, we are also aware that a tax abatement alone is not enough to fully subsidize the construction of an affordable unit, as restrictions from other public programs will likely still apply to the, union, the units that receive the tax abatement. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker for this public hearing is Blaise Rostello. Mr. Rostello, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin. Okay. Okay. Can everybody hear me okay? We can. Great. Uh, thank you, President Hawker and the rest of the council. Um, I'm, my name is Blaise Rustell. I'm actually testifying on behalf of myself today just as a Montgomery County resident. I am a professional in the affordable housing field. I work for Gilbane Development Company, but my testimony is uh, as a resident today. I'm, I'm thrilled um, about a pilot for um, affordable housing creation. I, I think that just a couple of things that I wanted to uh, let the council know today. I think it'll go a long ways for both the creation and preservation of new affordable housing. Um, I, I would agree and echo with some of the prior comments that um, any ability to get longer affordability, I think the way that legislation is drafted allows for the flexibility for at least 15 years. And then if there's automatic extensions, if uh, owners and operators wanna keep the affordability restrictions in place, that that should automatically extend. I, I think that's a really good idea. Um, I my, my one thing I do not understand and we'll try and uh, do some work and respond uh, prior to the July date is the, the partial pilot uh, seems to be a bit rigid. I'm not sure how, you know, translating just into one or two or three units of a full pilot for certain levels of affordability works across all different types of projects, both small buildings, large buildings, preservation projects versus new construction projects. I think it might be uh, a lot better if the director has flexibility to underwrite uh, transactions and, and be able to uh, issue partial pilots based on the actual need. Uh, for the project such that it's financially feasible and maximizes um, the amount of leverage of private dollars and minimizes the amount of public subsidy, capital subsidy up front into projects. So those were my only comments today. I really appreciate the uh, opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Our next speaker is AJ Jackson. Mr. Jackson, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin when you're ready. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. President and members of the council. I'm AJ Jackson. I'm an executive vice president with JBG Smith, a Bethesda-based real estate company that owns and operates about 1,600 apartments in the county. At JBG, I lead the Washington Housing Initiative, which is our effort to create and preserve affordable workforce housing, both in Montgomery County and in the Washington region. It's my pleasure to be here this afternoon to testify in support of Bill 2621. As the council may know, in Montgomery County, most of the apartments that are affordable to everyday workers are not MPDUs or designated affordable units. They're privately owned apartments in older buildings with moderate rents. And unfortunately, this housing is being lost at a rapid clip. In 2018, nearly 4,000 naturally affordable apartments in the county were sold, many to investors who hope to raise rents after converting them into near luxury housing. Bill 2621 will help investors and housing providers who are committed to maintaining housing affordability to compete for and preserve more of these properties as affordable housing. Payments in lieu of taxes are a powerful tool because reducing tax payments lowers the operating expenses of apartment buildings and thereby increases a property's net operating income. Said differently, for investors, the financial benefit of lowering taxes is the same as a financial benefit of raising rents. In the same way that having a higher income allows a home buyer to qualify for a larger mortgage, each dollar of property tax relief supports three, four, or more dollars of private mortgage financing to acquire and preserve affordable housing. 
Montgomery County's real estate market is competitive, and having this tool written into the statute in a way that both investors and affordable housing providers can rely on and underwrite will allow them to move at the speed of the market and acquire properties that might not otherwise be preserved in a ROFR process. I want to commend Council Members Reamer and Friedson for introducing this important legislation and urge the Council to adopt it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Mary Kolar. Ms. Kolar, you have two minutes. You may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Mary Kohler, and I'm testifying on behalf of Montgomery Housing Alliance. MHA strongly supports Bill 2621, establishing a minimum pilot for properties with affordable housing. Pilots targeted to affordable housing properties are one of several important tools that allow the county to effectively partner with housing providers to meet our collective production and preservation goals. We applaud the Council's commitment to affordable housing programs and your unanimous affirmation of the housing targets identified in the 2019 Council of Governments report. To make progress toward meeting these targets, the County needs an array of tools that allow developers to meaningfully provide affordable housing opportunities to households with low incomes. Pilots are one such critical tool. Establishing a minimum pilot for affordable housing will increase certainty for developers as they work to structure deals. Right now, ambiguity around whether a property will receive a pilot and the amount of that pilot adds one more variable that complicates the bidding process, potentially jeopardizing projects. A minimum pilot for affordable housing properties is also critical because it will amplify the county's investment in the HIF. When a property does not receive a pilot, a developer must seek a greater allocation from the HIF and ultimately a share of that HIF investment goes toward paying property taxes, therefore diluting the HIF. We estimate that every 100 unit affordable property not receiving a pilot costs the HIF approximately $1 million. Adding a minimum pilot to the toolbox available to developers will allow HIF dollars to go further and ultimately result in the production and preservation of more units. We urge one point of clarity in Bill 2621. It is critical to ensure that the pilot does not terminate after the 15-year minimum threshold so long as the housing provider maintains affordability beyond that period. The term of the benefit should be clearly linked to the term of affordability. Again, we urge the Council to support Bill 2621. Thank you for the opportunity to provide input. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker for this public hearing is Rob Goldman. Mr. Goldman, you have two minutes and you may begin when you're ready. Uh, good afternoon, Council President uh, Hucker and members of the Council. Uh, my name is Robert Goldman and I'm testifying on behalf of MHP in strong support of Bill 2621. I first want to thank Council Members Reamer and Friedson for introducing Bill 2621. This is an issue that the affordable housing community has been seeking to address for several years now. We are grateful for your leadership on this matter. Bill 2621 would restore the county's historical policy on tax abatements for affordable housing developments. Prior to 2014, it was the policy of the county to abate 100% of the county property taxes for a qualifying affordable housing property. Then around 2014, on the then DHCA director Snugs, the county made a sudden shift in that policy without any notice or warning and thereafter would only consider partial tax abatements on a case by case basis. This change has had a subtle but significant impact on the county's ability to expand and preserve affordable housing. Most notably, this change has had the harmful effect of diluting the housing initiative fund. If an affordable housing provider does not receive a full tax abatement from the county, the developer must find another source of funding to cover the property taxes. By necessity, affordable housing developers include the anticipated property tax in their HIF funding request to make their finances work. As a result, less of the HIF is available to fund actual units of affordable housing. The HIF should be dedicated to producing tangible, affordable housing, not paying property taxes. The current tax abatement policy has also hurt the ability of affordable housing developers to preserve much needed affordable housing as the current policy provides a relatively low amount of tax abatement for, rent for preservation projects. This bill provides a level, level of certainty as we work to purchase properties so we are better able to compete and preserve much needed affordable housing. The current system leads too much up to the discretion of DHCA. This bill is an important tool in our quest to develop more affordable housing in Montgomery County and help reach the affordable housing goals set out by the County Council. Also, I will say as a member of MHA, Montgomery Housing Alliance, we also support their testimony 
uh, uh, previous that was previously provided. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Goldman. Mr. President, that wraps up the speakers for this public hearing. Okay, thanks, Ms. Kennedy. Thanks to all of our speakers. Item seven is a public hearing on expedited bill 2921, contracts and procurement, minority owned businesses sunset date amendments. This bill would extend the sunset date for the county's minority owned business purchasing program and generally amend, amend the county's minority owned business purchasing program. A GEO committee work session will be scheduled at a later date and persons wishing to submit additional material for the council's consideration should do so before the close of business, July 27th. There are no speakers for this hearing. So this hearing is now closed as are the previous ones. Item eight is a public hearing on zoning text amendment 2102, independent living facility for seniors or persons with disabilities, residential zone standards. This ZTA would allow multiple build, building types for independent living facilities for seniors or persons with disabilities and amend the green area and setback requirements for independent living facilities for seniors or persons with disabilities. A Fed committee work session on this CTA is tentatively scheduled for Wednesday, July 28th, and persons wishing to submit additional material for the council's consideration should do so before the close of business tomorrow, July 21st. There are speakers for this public hearing. Ms. Kennedy, could you call on the first one, please? Yes, the first speaker for this public hearing is Suzanne Lee. Ms. Lee, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin when you're ready. Good afternoon, my name is Susan Lee and I'm testifying on behalf of the West Montgomery County Citizens Association on an issue of importance to not just the Potomac subregion, but the whole county. We oppose this latest attempt by the developers of uber high end townhouses and their attorneys to upend the basic tenets of the county zoning code in order to allow construction of their developments on every single parcel of land in the county, notwithstanding the statutorily established underlying zones. There are already all kinds of senior housing styles, including townhouses all over the county under the current zones. This is particularly outrageous when in response to the demands, you just enacted ZTA 20-08. As screwy as that ZTA was, the council created a whole new entity to ensure that whatever real or perceived problems there were with housing styles had been corrected. But that clearly wasn't enough, and now they are back. This time they focused on other group living provisions, which through the conditional use process already allow for multiple buildings to provide for group living. If you are in fact going to enact this, you must at a minimum retain the green space and setback requirements of the underlying zones. Under the basic zoning code provisions, the hearing examiner has to ensure that it's compatible with the surrounding neighborhood and she should be allowed to use the current standards. Also critical is that there be a bar on individual fee simple ownership of any of these units. Only people 62 and older and the disabled, their households and a resident caretaker can live in these units. Once the senior or disabled dies or moves to another level of care, everyone else has to move out. They can't sublet it, they can't let their grandchildren move in, and they can't turn it into an Airbnb. As a result, it is critical, absolutely critical, that there be only one entity who is, who is allowed to apply for and be approved for this conditional use for this group living housing, group, group housing facility. It is they who has to be responsible for ensuring these very stringent requirements and not 150 fee simple townhouse owners. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Patrick Byrne. Mr. Byrne, you also have two minutes. You may begin when you're ready. Um, good afternoon. My name is Patrick Byrne and I'm speaking today on behalf of Community Housing Initiative the developer of affordable housing in support of zoning tax amendment 21-02. The current 70% open space requirement hinders development of senior housing. The proposed zoning to tax, tax amendment addresses this issue. As we move into the 21st century land use and considering the dwindling space for new development for Montgomery County to create more affordable housing, the county must make smart development a priority. Since affordable housing is unable to pay the same land value as market rate housing, smart development means doing more with less. Senior independent housing communities have minimal impact on the surrounding communities in terms of traffic, schools, and fire and rescue services. Senior residential communities typically include a variety of self-contained common space uses that are tailored to the lifestyle of the residents. Such uses and space requirements include interior gyms, wellness centers, yoga, and activity project rooms, medical exam rooms, salons, and barber shops, and dog wash rooms. 
As for exterior space, raised garden boxes provide providing wheelchair access, dog play areas with benches and cleanup stations, paved walkways with lights and benches, barbecue spaces with tables and chairs, as well as fire pits with surrounding seating and outdoor space. In, sum, in summary, our typical projects provide amenity space that actively engage residents and is much more tailored to their lifestyles than large areas of unimproved open space. We look forward to working with council and staff on the zoning text amendment and I'm answer, happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Mr. President, this wraps up the speakers for this public hearing. Thanks so much to both of our speakers. Thanks, Ms. Kennedy. Um, <clears throat> item nine is a public hearing on zoning text amendment 2103, charitable philanthropic institution kitchens. This ETA would allow charitable and philanthropic institutions to have kitchens under certain circumstances. A Fed committee work session on this CTA is tentatively scheduled for Wednesday, July 28th. Persons wishing to submit additional material for the council's consideration should do so before the close of business tomorrow, July 21st. There are five speakers for this public hearing. Ms. Kennedy, would you mind calling on the first one, please? Yes, the first speaker for this public hearing is Audrey Siegel. Ms. Siegel, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin when you're ready. Okay, can you hear me? We can. Okay, perfect, thank you so much. Hi, I'm Audrey Siegel, I'm the Executive Director of Bicor Holim of Greater Washington, and I am here speaking on behalf of the organization. We operate the Bernard Creeker Bicor Holim House in Bethesda, Maryland. And I wanna thank this body, the council, five years ago introduced the original ZTA, which allowed us to operate this home, which is a guest house for patients and caregivers where all of the, where people can stay for free and receive a variety of support services. Bikur Holum means visiting the sick. The expanded meaning means taking care of the sick. Bethesda, I should say in Hebrew, it's transliterated into English. Bethesda comes from the Hebrew and Aramaic meaning house of mercy. So it's really fitting that the Bernard Krieger Bikur Holum house is in Bethesda, Maryland, a compassionate neighborhood in a compassionate community. For the past six years, we have served hundreds of patients and families thanks to this council's vision and support. We average one to two families a week. We currently have two families staying at the house right now. Why we're here today is to expand this vision to include a cooking kitchen where we would be able to cook meals, staff and volunteers together, coming together to cook free nutritious meals for the patients and caregivers that stay in the house, but also to send them out to other patients and caregivers that we serve throughout the county. This past year, I don't think I have to tell anybody that we've all learned a lot about what it means to be ill, facing illness, supporting others who are ill. And we need all kinds of support when we're ill, including financial, friendship, and food. Food is, a, you know, serves as a point of connection between peoples, the, those who deliver and those who receive, of course, it also is a tangible service that really helps people, but it does even more than that. It actually promotes healing by allowing people to focus on other things. When a hot, fresh meal is delivered to their house, they have the ability to focus on their family, to focus on their treatment plan, not to mention not having the added financial stress. So we really view this expansion of our mission as essential, especially now, we, are, we had a lot of time to think about it and plan it over this past year and a half, and we're grateful for this opportunity to consider supporting it. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker for this public hearing is William Commoners. Mr. Commoners, you also have two minutes. You may begin when you're ready. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, President Hucker and uh, members of the council. My name is Bill Commoners. I'm here as an individual today speaking in support of the ZTA 2103 and particularly supporting the modified language proposed by the planning board. Uh, I was involved in 2015 when ZTA 15-08 created this special, specialized charitable use, providing support for families that come to our area to receive treatment and care at facilities like the NIH. Your actions in 2015 gave life to a special place for these families, a place of refuge, as exemplified by Ms. Siegel's testimony. As she described, the ability to have added kitchen facilities will allow service providers in these facilities to better serve their guests without interfering with them. 
the host will be able to have an additional place to actually prepare full meals, healthier meals, uh, and religiously and culturally appropriate meals as needed. In addition, during this time when the pandemic has created greater food insecurity in the county, the host can also participate in helping other charitable organizations respond to that crisis. I did speak with the planning board and its staff about the proposed revised text for the new subsection D of section 59.3.4.2.B. That revised text uh, is preferable to the original language of the ZTA, and I urge you to make that change as was recommended by the planning board and its staff. Thank you for your consideration of my comments. I can try to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker for this public hearing is David Balto. Mr. Balto, you also have two minutes. You may begin. Thank you very much um, to the council for hearing my testimony. I'm David Balto. I'm test. Uh, I'm testifying as an individual. Um, but I have the um, special insight of being um, a hospital chaplain. And as a hospital chaplain, I know so much about the valuable work um, that Beaker Holim of Greater Washington does, um, the, the services they provide for patients and their families, uh, especially in times of need, are so invaluable, especially over the past year or so. And that's why um, the services they provide at Krieger House and their planned expansion of providing food services is so invaluable. Um, their expansion of being able to provide food services will make it easier for them to provide food for families and for other members of the community and caregivers um, who are in need. Um, and it's extraordinarily valuable services that really help people during the most urgent times, the times when they are dealing with their own sickness or dealing with the sicknesses of their dear ones. Um, I, you know, for all the reasons that Ms. Siegel and Mr. Commoner have articulated, um, this um, expansion um, would, um, um, the ability to provide these kinds of food services will provide very valuable services to the community. And I hope you uh, adopt the, um, the proposal as is written. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Deborah Miller. Ms. Miller, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Deborah Miller, and I'm the Director of Maryland Government and Community Relations for the JCRC of Greater Washington. I'm here today also in support of Zoning Text Amendment 2103, Charitable Philanthropic Institution Kitchens. As you know, the JCRC is the umbrella group representing over 100 Jewish social service agencies, synagogues, and schools throughout the greater Washington, D.C. region. One of our highest priorities is to advocate on behalf of our social service institutions that provide non-sectarian services to thousands of Montgomery County residents each year thereby contributing to creating a vibrant, inclusive, compassionate, and equitable community. We are particularly proud of Bikur Holim, which provides healthy, culturally appropriate kosher meals to patients and their caregivers for free. Last year, the organization served over 2,800 meals and are on track to exceed that number this year. It's truly remarkable. We support the ZTA, which will allow Bekor Holim to expand its mission with a kitchen on the premises so it can prepare and cook more meals to distribute to more patients and to more hospitals in need. ZTA 2103 is a win-win for the county. We thank the lead sponsor of this initiative, Council Member Andrew Friedson, and his co-sponsor, Council Member Nancy Navarro, who also worked on the original ZTA, and of course, the entire council for its support of Bakur Holim's critical work. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Tracy Friedlander. Ms. Friedlander, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin. Thank you and good afternoon. My name is Tracy Friedlander and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to testify in support of zoning text amendment number 2103 which would allow charitable and philanthropic institutions to have kitchens under certain circumstances. Over the last year, I've served as co-chair of Food for Montgomery, and I have seen firsthand not only the precarious nature of our food system, but also how many of our neighbors and residents are food insecure and are living with serious illnesses or life-challenging medical conditions. 
For many of these individuals, a medically tailored diet respecting the cultural and or religious needs has become a Herculean challenge. Charitable and philanthropic organizations like Bihora Aholim of Greater Washington have been addressing this challenge in Montgomery County by purchasing and delivering meals at no cost to patients, their families, and caregivers. They host families seeking medical care and treatment at NIH and other nearby hospitals at their Bernard Krieger Health in Bethesda. This amendment will allow them and other charitable philanthropic organizations like them to have kitchens and prepare meals for those in our community who are experiencing illness or life-challenging medical conditions. In turn, our community members who are sick can focus on healing and managing their illness as opposed to managing stress around food. Like the Council, I believe in a community where everyone has the nourishment they need to thrive. Food is medicine. Food heals. By allowing charitable and philanthropic institutions to have kitchens under certain circumstances, our Council is expanding the safety net for many of the most vulnerable in our community. By approving this amendment, you deliver hope, wellness, and compassion one meal at a time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. President, that wraps up the speakers for this public hearing. Thanks so much, Ms. Kennedy. Thank you to all our speakers. Item 10, this hearing is now closed. Item 10 is a public hearing and action on a special appropriation to the Montgomery County government's FY22 operating budget office of the county attorney in the amount of $700,000 for minority female and disabled owned business program disparity study. Action is scheduled immediately following this hearing. There, there are no public speakers for this hearing, so the, the hearing is now closed. Is there a motion to approve a special appropriation? So moved. So moved. Councilmember Navarro Second. moves. And Councilmember Rice seconds. Thank you for your help with this. Um, all those in favor of this special appropriation, please raise your hand. Aye. That is unanimous. Uh, thank you all. Terrific. Item 11 is, uh, our, is interviews of candidates for the Public Education Fund Committee, Public Election Fund Committee, sorry. Do we have Mr. Ewing, Mr. Lisson, Ms. Paul, and Ms. Saxton? Welcome. Thank you. Hello. Sorry to keep you waiting. Um, <laughs> Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I will ask uh, four questions. I think you've had, received them in advance. Um, I'll uh, uh, address you in alphabetic order to begin with and then probably rotate the questions just to, uh, to be fair and allow my colleagues to hear all your answers and then my colleagues may have additional questions as well. Um, so first, Mr. Ewing, tell us about your background and qualifications as they relate to serving on the Public Election Fund Committee and feel free obviously to introduce yourself as well. Yes, uh, my name is William Ewing, uh, best known as Bill. Um, I'm interested in serving on this particular committee because I've spent uh, over 30 years working in, uh, in political fundraising. I've done so uh, as a finance advisor to candidates and has worked 10 years uh, previously with Public, ca uh, public Campaign, which is a advocacy group for the public financing of elections. So I'm deeply interested in the issue, and I see it from both sides. I have witnessed what it takes for a candidate solely relying on private money to spend so much time and effort in trying to raise the funds necessary to run for an election and how that tends to limit the kinds of people that are able to run for elections. Uh, I've also seen some of the sides of what can happen with successful public financing programs, particularly those in, in uh, Connecticut, Maine, and to a certain extent, Arizona. And uh, I'm interested to learn more about the operations that are going on here in Montgomery County so that I can get a better understanding of what we might be able to do going forward. So. Terrific. Mr. Lissom. Good afternoon, uh, President Hucker. Good afternoon, uh, Council Member and everyone else on the call. And thank you for the opportunity to um, share, you know, not only my background, my skills with you all today. Um, I want to say that I've been an accounting and finance professional for most of my career. And as a servant leader today uh, in my current role, I have definitely developed all of the skills, abilities, qualifications, you know, necessary to excel as a member uh, of the uh, committee for the public election friends. As a longtime um, Montgomery County resident, I have witnessed firsthand um, how the county runs. And uh, this has ignited in me the desire to 
get involved, you know, in many different ways, you know, not only by, you know, learning and uh, fellowshipping with the uh, the communities that surround me, but also by um, trying to help the county altogether move forward um, by putting my skills and experience, you know, to the service of my um, uh, the, my fellow constituents, in a sense. So um, the, my desire here is what, you know, not only to use my experience, but also to uh, reach out and empower the communities that surround me, the communities that uh, we share here in the in Montgomery County. And uh, I believe that, you know, based on my background, I would be the ideal or one of the ideal people to add to the committee at this time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Paul. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Miriam. And I, um, in my professional background, I've been a grant and contract administrator for over 15 years. Um, I have experience in um, hospital administration and higher education, and also a executive member of Community Action Board Agency. Um, being part of this um, committee would help me um, um, branch and educate um, or empower um, some of the um, residents that we see um, to the Community Advocacy um, Institute by way of CAB um, who have interest on running in the future for, um, um, for council, for the community. Um, having this um, community um, program will help these individuals um, running on their constituent or the community ideas. And with that being said, those ideas will help them win because they have um, the opportunity to actually um, focus on the, the advocacy piece and educating um, um, their constituent without having the ability to um, go against the big dollars. Um, and this funding with the people that they're working with will help them duplicate the funding to just focus on, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I think I'm going around. But uh, the yeah. idea is this program help um, candidate focus on the their constituent, right? They're working on um, what the constituent need to hear. They're working on their ideas. And with that ideas, the constituent will help them, um, will support them by um, register to vote and then um, help them win and give money because they know that their money will be put to good use. I hope that helps. That was great. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Thank Ms. Saxton. Well, first of all, thank you. You got my last name right. Normally, a lot of people don't get it right on the first try. But um, thank you for having me, and thank you for uh, considering me for the position. I would say that my qualifications are threefold. If you're looking at the purposes of the law that goes into effect for public uh, funding for elections, it's to encourage greater voter participation in county elections, increase opportunities for more residents to run for office, and to reduce the influence of large contributions from businesses and PACs when it comes to uh, election matters. So I feel very strongly just serving as my time as the president of the Montgomery County Young Republicans. I've gotten to talk to a lot of different people, help out with getting people registered to vote and hear about what they care about. And one of the biggest things that I think is a barrier to entry for people is whether or not they can self-fund their elections. But you talk to so many people when you're volunteering the way that I am on what's important to them and, and how much great ideas they have. And the thing that's keeping them from running for office is, is they can't run their own campaigns. They can't fund their own campaigns. And I don't think that should be a barrier to entry when you're considering potentially really amazing candidates for office, particularly municipal and local elections. Uh, my qualifications aside from YRs is I'm currently getting my master's in project management from Georgetown University. And in my time there, I've learned a lot about um, project planning and estimating, and that goes to everything to the granular level for individual uh, line items. And I believe that those skills can be transitioned particularly well for uh, estimating how much money would be needed for this committee. In addition, my uh, job, which I do, I work for Kaiser Permanente and I do marketing operations, has nothing to do with politics, but again, gives me that opportunity to spend my day to day focusing on um, moving around people resources, but financial resources as well, and planning for what kind of budgeting we would need for the upcoming year and the beginning year as well. And also 
switching those budgets on the fly as things are moving around. We might have planned for one thing, but we have contingency plans for about 10 different other things as the year progresses. So that's where I think that my skill set lies and how I think that the, that can transition really well into this committee. And also my personal passion for making sure that anybody who believes that they're a strong candidate for office is not uh, you know, blocked out of the process of doing so just because they're not able to self fund their campaigns. Great. Thank you. Thank you for all your answers. Okay, Mr. Lissom, you're first this time. The primary role of the committee is to estimate the funds necessary to implement the public finance system and to recommend to us an annual appropriation for the following fiscal year by the council. Describe your experience researching past expenses and estimating future expenses. Thank you, President Hucker. I would like to say that um, as an accounting and finance professional and as a small business owner, that is exactly what I've been doing, building up my career. You know, um, I can talk about, you know, researching past uh, expenses, you know, using uh, multiple audit methods and um, practices and ensuring compliance checking. Um, this is something that I've been doing on a day-to-day -day basis for the past 15 years. Um, another part of my responsibilities has always been to be able to estimate future expenses, you know, by preparing budgets, uh, following accounting and financial methods, and also by streamlining processes for future use. You know, all of this to say that during my career, I have been able to successfully manage already uh, billions of dollars and to generate millions more by um, just improving processes, you know, within the different companies that I've worked for. Um, this uh, was done also by me using different ways to uh, promote expense reduction and um, establish a lean approach to um, prioritization within different organizations that I've worked with. Um, all this knowledge, I believe, you know, um, you, you've probably seen uh, my resume, you have an idea of my background, all this knowledge, I believe, is definitely going to be put to good use because I, I know I can be a great asset within the community uh, with the experience that I have. I know that it's 100% uh, transferable knowledge, and I know it's going to be very helpful um, being used within the community for the greater use of the county altogether. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Ms. Paul. Hello. Yes. Um, as I said earlier, I've been in Green State contract for about 15 years. All I do on my daily basis is actually um, reviewing and auditing um, financial reporting and expenses, forecasting for um, future year um, or next 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 um, quarterly spending. In addition to ensuring that we are reporting out to our sponsors. Um, appropriately and ensuring that we're not where the expenses that are coming in are allowable and allocate allocable with this transferable skills I should be able to review the spending going on and ensuring that we're following process and procedures of the counties and also in um, bringing new ideas where it needed and um, so we can actually improve the process in the future or currently great Ms. Saxton Yep, so I spoke a little bit in the last question about my job doing creative operations budgeting, but in particular also I want to focus on what I'm learning with my master's degree, in particular uh, implementing historical knowledge, which I'm sure um, the local government and the county government has all of that documentation of previous years budgeting and really looking through that historical data and also using bottom up estimating and forecasting of future numbers, including inflation, things like that, to really put together a strong estimate for the, the committee for the following year. And those are tex techniques that I've been studying now for almost a year and putting into practice in my own job, which has proven to be successful, that I think can be transferable to this committee and um, really nail down some solid estimating and forecast better than potentially what we're doing now. Great, and Mr. Ewing. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, I think one of the most challenging aspects of running a campaign is trying to figure out how much it's going to cost to win an election. And I've been involved on that uh, on, on many, many occasions, helping to establish budgets, helping to meet budgets. Uh, oftentimes, candidates will develop what's known as an A or B or C budget, the A budget being, if I have this much money, I have a good chance of winning. If I have this much money, which is the B budget, I could win if I got lucky. And the C budget is I can pay my staff, pay the rent, and come out looking respectable. All of this is determined about how much money is available. 
Also, it's important to determine how much money per vote it's going to cost to reach the people you need to reach in order for them to understand your message and perhaps cast a ballot in your favor. And that's always challenging. Um, in my experience, it's been a battle between those who advocate for radio or print media or door to door. Uh, all of these things cost money. All of them cost a different amount of money. And I think that in the final analysis, what might make the most sense is to take a look at past campaigns and take a look at just exactly how much per vote did it cost for the winners. And not just the winners, but also the losers. What makes for a competitive campaign? It's always difficult to assess what's the best method to reach out to voters. That's often up to the candidate themselves, what they're comfortable with. But given the size of the county, so many of the races, it becomes impossible to go door to door, as the old adage is, and door knock your way into a victory. So uh, I think I can bring some experience to the table about how you craft budgets and what it actually takes to run a campaign. It's more than just meeting people. It's rent. It is telephones. It is all these things. So I feel I have some experience that I can bring to the table. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Paul, your turn to be first. The committee is also responsible for conducting outreach and educational activities to raise awareness of the public financing system. If appointed, how would you position this role to reach all communities? Um, so one thing I will probably be doing is um, connecting with other uh, co um, communities within who are doing education. Um, and I, one of the um, one of the um, program that I know or communities I know right now is Common Cause, who does a lot of um, educational um, um, resources to um, the communities to help them engage, to help them understand what that program is all about and how to get themselves or their foot wet on that. So that's one piece. And the other piece is actually connect with my, um, in a non-partisanship, connecting with my community, people I know who want to run for office, uh, people I know who has ideas and I can help them understand how the process work and where to go to get ideas. So. In terms of outreach, I will actually connect with people within the communities, um, friends, <laughs> um, and also connect with other programs, other uh, communities, other act, uh, programs who are doing the educational piece um, to, to help uh, spread the word out. Terrific. Ms. Saxton? So I'm pretty sure I was an event planner in another life because I love the idea of doing outreach and community events, and it's something I do a lot for young Republicans. But what I would recommend is reaching out to both the Republican and Democrat Central Committees. Um, and even I think that this is something that can be inspired and done statewide. Um, you know, other counties can look to us for inspiration. But doing events, I know, um, at least on the Republican end, which I'm more familiar with, we do candidate trainings. So if we are finding out that there are candidate trainings on both sides, reaching out, finding out those dates, having somebody from the committee who's familiar in attendance to do a brief presentation on public committee fund, uh, public election funding, how they can get the resources, things like that. And for people who might not be involved in their local central committees or their local parties, doing other community-based events as well that can be targeted through um, social media. And you can do a little, a little bit of paid social media goes a long way and it's super affordable as well as um, doing texting to potential candidates and three fours and four fours in the area as well, because those are the people I think that you might see stepping up to run for office one day. And the average for texting a voter is about six cents per text. There's a lot of really great platforms out there you could do it on. So I think there's a lot of innovative ways to get the word out. And then it's just a matter of planning an engaging event. I know as we're still in a shaky situation with COVID and the Delta variant, it's really easy like you guys do your meetings here to set them up over Zoom and to do a Zoom discussion. And there's other opportunities, I think, as things begin to open up more as well to do in-person events where there are people able to come and talk to people about their campaigns, what their options are for public funding, and the best way to get them involved. And a lot of people just don't know that first step of, I want to run for office, now what? You know, and being there to answer those questions for them. Thank you. Mr. Ewing. Didn't have to learn about the mute button. I endorse all of those things. People have brought forth great ideas, and I don't have that much to add other than to say that I would certainly encourage candidates using the public election fund to make sure that when they're speaking, they talk about their, their use of that fund and how important it was for them to be able to, to run for office. Other things that might be considered, and I know this has been referenced earlier, is reaching out to all sorts of groups to see whether or not they want to have someone come and talk about what the public education uh, election fund does for the county. Um, 
and that could include anything from any meeting that, that people have together. Uh, oftentimes they're at a loss for a presentation or a speaker, and we could be clear in, in being able to offer that opportunity. I would also suggest that perhaps we try and get into some of the civics classes that are being held at high school level so that our young people begin to understand what the advantages of a public funding of elections have for them and for their futures and for the candidates they might wish to support. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lissom? Thank you, President Hucker. I believe that um, yeah, a lot has been said already by the uh, other candidates. I just want to add that the uh, committee definitely has a role to play in reaching out to all communities. And uh, it's a very important one. And it's um, important also that it reflects in not only on the field, but also in the composition of the comedy. You know, the latest census shows, for example, that, you know, you have about 60% of the population uh, of Montgomery County that sits between 18 and 25. And uh, out of that total population, you have about 40% that speaks a language other than English at home. Uh, I believe that it will be important, you know, to, um, in order to expand our reach and in order to, um, uh, 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 really educate more of the population of the county. It would be important to start speaking their language, you know, to try to like educate them in a language that they understand, um, but also using platforms that are mainly used by uh, most of the constituents in the county. You know, we have a very young population um, as of now, and it's been um, getting younger and younger. As we know, a lot of this population is not really um, turning towards TV anymore, you know, to get the news and to get the information that they need. Uh, it's really time. We're really in the age of social media now. We're really in the age of people doing everything from their cell phones. So that means that, you know, one of the primary means of communication might have to be cell phones. And when it comes to social media, also we want to use, you know, strategies and, 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 and techniques that really bring results. Today we're in the age of podcasts, blogs, you know, influencers, you know, those are oftentimes means to really like relay information that's a little faster than traditional means of communication, you know, and those are things that we want to be considering in the future. And once again, I believe that um, bringing uh, someone like me on board would definitely, you know, open doors to uh, implementing such practices and um, new methods, you know, to reach out to our communities in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, question for Ms. Saxton. Are there any potential conflicts of interest of which we should be aware? So obviously, as my role as president of the Montgomery County Young Republicans, I interact with a lot of potential candidates who are considering public funding. However, I don't consider this to be a conflict of interest. Like I mentioned earlier, my passion is that we should be opening up the floor to anybody who feels like they have good ideas and are a potentially good candidate, regardless of what side of the aisle they are on or neither aisle. You know, I know some people are independents. Um, so my passion is just making sure that anybody who has a good idea and the will to run has the ability to do so. So, and I don't work for any candidates. I don't work in politics at all. So I don't believe that I have any kind of uh, conflicts of interest for this committee. Great, thank you, Mr. Ewing. Yeah, yes, um, I don't seem to be on the screen. You're on, we see you. Oh, okay, fine. Um, Outside of my partisan affiliation and my long work as a Democrat working as a paid staffer on campaigns, I don't see any other conflict of interest, especially because I'm retired and I'm no longer active on any campaigns at this moment, nor do I plan to be. Um, so I, I, I think that I don't, because I'm such an advocate for the idea of public financing, I think that could be a positive. I'm willing to share my ideas with people on both sides of the aisle, so to speak, and for those who don't even have an aisle to be on the side of. So uh, I feel I'm okay for that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lissom. Thank you. I don't see any conflict of interest on my end. Uh, I would say that I'm 100% ready and available to take on the role and uh, to do what it takes, you know, to take it to the next level. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Paul, Ms. Paul. <laughs> um, likewise, I do not have any uh, conflict um, other than being part of um, Community Action Board Agency um, in a member of the Community um, Advocacy Institute, other than doing community outreach, I don't see any conflict, but willing to be part of this committee and um, bring a new, a fresh, fresh and new ideas to the team. Thank you. Okay. Um, colleagues, any questions? Seeing none. Okay. Well, let me thank all of you on behalf of all my colleagues. Uh, I know it's a lot to put yourself out there. Um, thanks so much for your willingness to build a stronger county for us, and we'll get it, be getting back to you with our decision as quickly as possible.
Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we can move to Legislative Day 19. We have two introductions today. Item 13A is the introduction of Expedited Bill 3121, Property Tax Credits, Energy Conservation Devices, and Energy Efficient Buildings Amendments. Uh, I will now recognize Ms. Wellens. Ms. Wellens, do you have anything to add? Um, thank you, Mr. President. Um, this bill, Expedited Bill 31-21, um, it has been requested by the county executive mm -hmm. and it will make some amendments and clarifications related to property tax credits for energy conservation devices and energy efficient buildings. It repeals a sunset clause related to um, one of these property tax credits and it lays out and, and kind of clarifies timelines for various applications for the credits. Um, a public um, public hearing is scheduled for September 14th. Thank you. Perfect. Any questions, colleagues? Okay. Without further ado, that bill is introduced. Uh, next is Bill 3221, Personnel Employee Settlement Agreement with No Rehire Clause Prohibited. Um, this bill would prohibit that I'm the lead sponsor and the public hearing is scheduled for September 14th at 1.30. This bill would prohibit no rehire clauses from county employee settlement agreements. When an employee files an employment dispute or claim against the county and a settlement agreement is offered, it contains often a no, hire, no rehire clause that would prevent the employee from ever seeking for future employment opportunities within the county. This automatic bar places an undue burden on county employees who may have gained several years of knowledge, skill, and ability with no viable option to return to county employment even after the dispute has been settled. Our employees are our most valuable asset, and this bill reaffirms our commitment to an equitable and just workplace. I want to thank the NAACP for reaching out to me on this issue um, about the need for this legislation, and I look forward to working with stakeholders and my colleagues on this bill. Mr. Uh, Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. You know, I would think that we should have a different title for this. It's confusing that the way it is written, it's saying, uh, an agreement with a no rehire clause. And what we're doing is that which someone would be allowed to be rehired. So I don't know if that can be clarified. Right. Okay. That's a great suggestion for the first work session. Thank you. You're, I think you're right. Okay. If there are no further comments, that bill is introduced as well. That concludes our legislative session. I now propose a closed session to consult with council to obtain legal advice pursuant to Maryland Code General Provisions Article 3305B7 and to consult with staff, consultants, and other individuals about pending or potential litigation pursuant to Maryland Code General Provisions Article 3305B8. The topic is the FOP versus Montgomery County. Is there a motion to meet in a closed session? So Public Safety Chairman Katz moves and? Second. Councilmember Jawando seconds. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Aye. Aye. That is unanimous. Okay. Thank you, Councilmember Rice. Um, thank you all. We will see you in closed session.